order. Questions to the Prime Minister. John Woodcock. Yeah. Question one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, today marks two years since the Manchester Arena attack. It was a cowardly and sickening attack that deliberately targeted innocent and defenceless children. Members from across the House will want to join me in sending my thoughts and prayers to the families and friends of all the victims. And I'm sure members will also want to join me in paying tribute to the immense bravery and courage that the emergency services showed that night. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. John Woodcock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I know the whole, the whole House will want to associate themselves with the words she has just spoken about, the Manchester attack. Now, she may not have long left, and good luck with those meetings later today, but she can act now against the return of banned chemical weapons. British experts are this morning investigating a suspected chlorine attack by al-Assad in Idlib. Will, if it is proved, will she lead the international response against the return of this indiscriminate evil? Yeah. Well, Prime the, the Honourable Gentleman is right to raise the issue of the evil of the use of chemical weapons. We, of course, acted in Syria with France and the United States uh, when we saw chemical weapons being used in Syria. We, of course, suffered uh, the use of chemical weapons here on the streets of the United Kingdom and took a robust response supported by our international friends and allies. And we condemn all use of chemical weapons. We are in close contact with the United States. We are monitoring the situation closely. And if any use of chemical weapons is confirmed, we will respond appropriately. But our position is clear. We consider Assad incapable of delivering a lasting peace, and his regime lost its legitimacy due to its atrocities against its own Syrian people. Antoinette Sandbach. Thank you, yeah, uh, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Does the Prime Minister agree that energy efficiency measures are critical in tackling t uh, climate change? Bringing every home up to a BPC C standard could save 25% of electricity generation, yeah, yeah, yeah. the equivalent of six nuclear Hinkley Point nuclear power stations. It could save every family £270, and it could potentially pay for itself by generating £1.27 uh, £1 for every pound invest invested in it. Prime Minister. Well, my, I think my honourable friend has made an, an excellent point, and uh, we, like her, absolutely recognise the importance of this issue. So the government is committed to improving energy efficiency in two and a half million homes by 2030. And our aim is to bring two and a half million fuel poor homes up to an energy performance certificate C rating by 2030. And as my honourable friend has said, this will indeed help to save energy and also bring down bills. Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in commemorating all the victims of the Manchester bombing two years ago. Our thoughts are with the friends and the family of all those that were killed, the survivors and, of course, the emergency service workers who gave such heroic service that night. They live with the horrors of this for the rest of their lives, and 10.31 tonight will be a very poignant moment for many people in Manchester. Mr Speaker, I also want to pay tribute to the last survivor of the whole headscarf revolutionaries, Yvonne Blenkinsop. She is visiting Parliament today. She led a campaign for basic safety on the UK's fishing fleets in the 1960s, and as a result, many lives were saved. I think people like her have made such an enormous contribution to our national life, they should be recognised for it. I also, Mr Speaker, want to express on behalf of the Labour Party my outrage that the Government has again failed our steel industry, putting 5,000 jobs at risk in British steel, 20,000 more in the supply chain. This Government has failed those people and, even at this late stage – and there is a statement later on today – must step in to save those jobs. Yeah. Mr Speaker, could I ask the Prime Minister why are schools having to close early on Friday afternoon due to spending cuts? Prime Minister. 
Can I first of all say to the right honourable gentleman, because he has raised the issue of British Steel, and obviously we recognise that this is a worrying time for the thousands of dedicated British steel workers and their families, but also those in the supply chain and local communities. We have indeed, the government has been working tirelessly with the company, with its owner, Graybull Capital, and lenders to explore all potential options to secure a solution for the company. Um, we showed through the ETS agreement that we were willing to act, but we can only act within the law. And it is clear that uh, it would be unlawful to provide a guarantee or loan on the terms requested by the company. We will be working with the company and others and the official receiver uh, in the days and weeks ahead to ensure that we can pursue every step to secure the future of the operations at Scunthorpe, Skinning Grove and on Teesside. My right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, has also agreed an indemnity for the official receiver to enable British Steel to continue to operate in the immediate future. There are no job losses at this time, and the official receiver has already said staff will continue to be paid and employed. And my right hon. Friend, the Business Secretary, will be updating the House in a statement later this afternoon. And on the issue of schools, as the right hon. Gentleman knows, we are putting record levels of funding into our schools. Well, that would explain why 26 schools close early on a Friday every week, because they don't have enough money to keep themselves open. And, <clears throat> Mr Speaker, there are more than 1,000 schools across England that are turning to crowdfunding websites with a wish list of things they want to raise money to buy. Really exotic things like pencils, like glue, like textbooks. Why? Are they forced to do this if they allegedly have enough money in the first place? Prime Minister. Mr. Right, honourable gentlemen, as I've said here before, we, and I've just quoted, we are putting record levels of funding into our schools. We have also put in place, we've also put in place to ensure a fairer distribution of, uh, of the funding between our schools. We are giving every area more money for every pupil in every school. But what, what is important in our education system is not just about what government puts in, it's about what edu quality of education is received by the children. There are more children in good and outstanding schools, the disadvantage attainment gap has been, uh, has been narrowed, and record rates of disadvantaged young people are going to university. That's a record to be proud of. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, I don't know if the Prime Minister had a chance to listen to or read the words of the, Na the General Secretary of the National Association of Head Teachers. He said, and I quote, the fact that so many schools are doing this should be ringing serious alarm bells for the government. The Prime Minister doesn't seem to be aware of the crisis that's facing so many in education at the present time. So can she be very clear with the House? Has per pupil funding risen or fallen since 2010? Prime Minister. Right, honourable gentlemen, we're giving every area more money for every pupil in every school. But why, why are we, why are we able to do that? It's because the Conservatives have taken a balanced approach to our economy and managed our finances well. What would Labour give us? One thousand billion extra pounds in borrowing. That would mean higher taxes, fewer jobs, and less money to go into our schools. Mr. Out in two ways, Mr. Speaker. One is a Labour government would properly fund our schools. We wouldn't shortchange our children. We wouldn't use Orwellian words like fair funding while we're cutting. Yeah. Per pupil funding, Mr Speaker, just so the Prime Minister understands it, has fallen by 8%. For sixth forms, it's 24%. At the end of last year, the Prime Minister said, austerity is over. <laughs> Maria, who describes herself as a teacher in an underfunded school, wrote to me this week. And she asked this. Maria is a teacher in an underfunded school. I think you need to listen to her. Yeah. When will the government stop making false claims of increased funding for schools and start to tackle the serious problems faced by teachers? When will the cuts end for our children's schools? Yeah. Prime Minister. I repeat what I said. We are giving every area more money for every pupil in every school. But let's just see, let's just see the situation. 
that this government inherited and that we would see under a Labour government in the future, having to spend more on debt interest than on our school's budget. That's not because of what this government is doing, because we're bringing debt down. It's the, it's the legacy left by a Labour government. More money on debt than on our schools. Jeremy Corbyn! What this government has squandered is what it inherited. Children's centres, short start, children taken out of poverty. It squandered the future for so many of our children. And order! Order! Mr Burkhart, you're an educated young man. When you came into the house, you struck me as a very well-behaved fellow. Calm yourself and listen. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Department of Education's funding chief met with school leaders recently and he told them the first thing to say is obviously they are not generous budgets. He's very, very cautious with his words. They are budgets which leave schools with real pressures to face. Everyone agrees, Mr Speaker, that our creative industries in this country are an enormous strength to our economy. So why then have the arts borne the brunt of the government's brutal cuts to school funding? So many children losing out on music and creative art in our schools because of decisions made by central government. My Minister! I say to the right honourable gentleman, he started his question by claiming that this government had squandered what had been left by the last Labour government. Let's just look at what was left by the last Labour government. don't want to be reminded what they left in the last time they were in government. What did the last Labour government leave? Unemployment higher than when it went into office. What did the last Labour government leave? The biggest deficit in our peacetime history. And what were we told by the departing Chief Secretary to the Treasury? Under Labour, there is no money left. My question, Mr Speaker, was actually about funding for arts and creative subjects in schools. A survey has shown that nine out of ten secondary schools have cut back on lesson time, staff or facilities in at least one of the creative arts subjects. Are the artists and actors of tomorrow only to come from the private schools while she continues to cut the funding for state schools? When the Prime Minister says that school funding has been protected, she's denying, Mr Speaker, the daily experience of teachers, parents and pupils. She's denying the incontrovertible evidence of the IFS, education bodies and teaching unions. She is actually in outright denial. And when the wealth of the richest 1,000 people has increased by £50 billion in the last year alone, don't tell us the money isn't there for our children's schools. This government has cut vital public services to give tax cuts to the privileged few. Can the Prime Minister name a more damaging policy, a more short-sighted policy, than cutting investment in our future, our children? Yeah. Prime Minister! I say to the right honourable gentleman, the richest have paid more tax every year under the Conservatives. No, wait for it. They have paid more under every year under the Conservatives than in any year under a Labour government. And he talks about what happens in our schools. As I've said, we are putting record funding into our schools. But what matters is the quality of education that our children get. Labour oppose the phonics checks. They want to scrap academies and free schools. They'd abolish SATs. That doesn't help to raise the standards in our schools. But let's just look, let's just look at the Labour record. When they were in government, standards were lower than they are today. Where they are in government in Wales, standards are lower than in England. And if they were to get into government, we would see more of the same. Lower standards, less opportunity, less opportunity for young people for a brighter future under Labour. It's the Conservative Party that give good quality of education, good jobs and a good future. Mr Ranald J. Wardener. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can my right honourable friend explain why she ordered that the consultation on the troubles in Northern Ireland should not contain proposals for a statute of limitations, as was reported in the Sunday Telegraph? And can she update us on what the government will actually get on and do? Prime Minister. First of all, he shouldn't necessarily uh, believe all the reports he reads in the newspapers. But let me be very clear on this particular issue. Around 3,500 people were killed in the Troubles. The vast majority were murdered by terrorists. The legal position is clear. Any amnesty or statute of limitations would have to apply across the board. It would apply to terrorists. I am not prepared to accept a proposal which brings in amnesties for terrorists. Ian Blackford. I will state myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister of the heinous crimes that took place two years ago in Manchester. We all must stand together against terrorism. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's customs tariff plan has been described by the UK's former representative to the EU as the definition of insanity. Her customs union compromise already dismissed by the European Union. Isn't this new deal just a fantasy? Yeah. Prime Minister. Now, says the right honourable gentleman, I have set out the ten points about the New Deal. There is an issue about customs. There is a difference of opinion in this House on the future customs arrangement with the European Union. That is why it is important that this House actually comes to a decision on that issue. Uh, allowing second referen- uh, the, uh, the second uh, reading of the withdrawal agreement bill will enable this House to come to a decision on that issue. It will also enable the House to come to a decision on a second referendum, which I continue to believe would not be the right route for this country to go down. We should deliver on the first referendum before <laughs> suggesting anything about a second. Ian Blackford. Yeah. My goodness, talk about ignoring reality. Prime Minister, look at the benches behind you. The Prime Minister is fooling no one but herself. And the truth, Mr Speaker, is that the people of Scotland don't want her deal. Her own party doesn't want her deal. And now even the pro-Brexit Labour front bench won't support her deal. Her time is up. Tomorrow, people in Scotland have a choice to send a message, to send pro-European outward-looking Scottish National Party MEP MPs to Brussels to stop Brexit. Prime Minister, what party does she think the people of Scotland will choose? Prime Minister! There is only one party in Scotland guaranteeing no more referendums, and that's the Conservative Party. Thank you, sir. Colleagues, Calm yourselves. Dignity, restraint. Let's hear Mr. Heapy. Thank you, sir. My constituent, Jackie Luxon, was 26 weeks pregnant at the time of a car crash that caused her baby to be stillborn. However, only the injuries caused to Mrs. Luxon and their older daughter were were relevant when charging and subsequently sentencing the driver whose dangerous driving caused the crash. The baby, Grace, got no justice at all. And I understand from the police and stillbirth support groups that the Luxon's tragic experience is sadly far from unique. Will the Prime Minister look again at the 1988 Road Traffic Act so that those who cause death to viable babies over 24 weeks gestation through dangerous driving can be held responsible for these tragic losses of life? Prime Minister. I say to my honourable friend, first of all, I know that all members from across the House, and it will have been obvious in the response to his question, will want to join me in sending deepest sympathies to my honourable friend's constituent. As my honourable friend will know, the courts can already uh, and do consider harm caused to a mother or unborn child in sentencing for an offence. And I know my honourable friend has discussed changing the law on this particular issue with the Ministry of Justice. They are concerned that there could be 
far-reaching, unintended consequences of doing so, but I have asked them to keep the law under review. I know that my honourable friend, along with others in this House, will be continuing to work on this issue. I'm sure everybody recognises the compassion that my honourable friend is showing in raising this issue. What we want to ensure is that uh, what he is proposing is not something that could lead to other unintended consequences uh, of the sort that he would not wish to see. Ronnie Cowan. Mr Speaker, Prime Minister, it has been brought to my attention that some children suffering from severe epilepsy have been able to greatly reduce and in some cases end their seizures if they have got access to bedrolite. Due to the cumbersome and discriminatory system this government implemented on 1 November 2018, parents are required to travel abroad, pay thousands of pounds and break the law to bring medicine back, or pay extraordinary prices to access bedrolite privately in the UK. Rather than people having to fight for access on a case-by-case basis, will the Prime Minister apply some common sense and show a soup song of compassion? and do everything she can to make medical cannabis available to the many people that are suffering and ensure that those who can benefit do. Yeah. Prime Minister. Um, can, I, can I say to uh, the honourable gentleman that these are, I, I fully understand that these cases are desperately difficult and, and my sympathies are with the families and friends. The government did change the law, as he said, and specialist doctors on the General Medical Council specialist register can now prescribe cannabis-based products for medicinal use where there is clinical evidence of benefit. Uh, NHS England and the Chief Medical Officer have made it clear that cannabis-based products can be prescribed for medicinal use in appropriate cases, but we must trust doctors to make clinical decisions in the best interests of patients. Give it on in, Ray. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. When Sally Masterton discovered a £1 billion fraud at Lloyd's, the bank sought to discredit her to the regulator, constructively dismissed her and prevented her working, working with a police investigation who had described her role as vital. Five years later, the bank apologised and paid an undisclosed amount of compensation, yet the FCA continued to refuse to investigate. Would the Prime Minister use her powers to compel them to do so and sanction those responsible, including, if relevant, the Chief Executive for those five years, Antonio Horta Osorio? I say to my honourable friend, I think it's, uh, it's important to remember that the events at HBOS Reading Branch constituted criminal activity, and it's right that those responsible were brought to justice. The FCA are currently conducting two investigations into the events at HBOS Reading, including the bank's communications with regulators following the discovery of the misconduct. And Lloyds have appointed a former High Court judge, Dame Linda Dobbs, to consider whether issues related to HBOS Reading were properly investigated and reported by Lloyds Banking Group. Those findings will be shared with the FCA, and I look forward to the conclusion of all those investigations. David Perkins. Mr Speaker, Brampton Primary School in Chesterfield has an exemplary record in special needs education. Yet under the government's funding formula, the first £6,000 of every special needs child isn't actually funded by the government. When even the Tory lead member for education in Derbyshire describes a school like Brampton as a victim of their own success, isn't it time that the Prime Minister, in her final days, changed the funding formula and started looking after those special needs children? Yeah. I say to the honourable gentleman, we have been putting more money into special educational needs. I recognise, I recognise, I recognise that for many parents, getting the uh, support that is re- required for their children can be a difficult process with the, uh, with the local authorities. We recognise the importance of special needs, and that is precisely why we have putting, been putting extra support in there. Mr. Asdabert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I thank the uh, Prime Minister for the amount of British aid which flows through to the World Food Programme in Yemen, and ask if she's noted in the last 20, 48 hours a report by its excellent director, David Beasley, drawing attention to the diversion of aid and the theft of aid in Houthi-controlled areas by Houthi authorities. Would she urge the international community to increase the pressure on Houthi leadership to resolve this and 
and, and further the efforts for peace in Yemen, rather than take the slightly easy course of always focusing on the Yemeni government and the Saudi-led coalition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my right honourable friend raises a very important point. We are all concerned about the humanitarian situation in the Yemen. As he rightly says, this government has a good record in terms of the amount of uh, money that we are providing, the aid that we are providing to help those in the Yemen. But of course, it is only of benefit if it is able to reach those who need it. And it is incumbent on all uh, parties to ensure that that aid reaches those who need it. We will continue to support the efforts to bring a lasting peace to the Yemen. Uh, a political settlement there is the way to get that, sustainab that uh, sustainability and security for the future. Um, but it is incumbent on everybody to make sure that the aid that is being provided for those who are desperately in need is able to reach those who need it most. Stephen Morgan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On the 5th of June, the eyes of the world will be on Portsmouth for D-Day 75. Events planned will give justice to the sacrifices made by veterans, like my own grandfather, and will show Portsmouth to be a place that fosters a legacy of remembrance, reflection and reconciliation. Our allies in World War II, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the US, have all taken the steps to ensure coroners record suicide amongst the veteran community. Prime Minister, why don't we? Prime Minister! Can I say, first of all, to the Honourable Gentleman, that it is indeed right that the eyes of the world will be on Portsmouth <coughs> for the D-Day National Commemorative event. This will be putting our veterans first. It remembers their sacrifices and their achievements, and we will highlight the historic strength of the Western Alliance and the Transatlantic Partnership. Um, he's raised a specific issue in relation to the coroner's reports, and I will write to him on, in response to that. But can I say that I look forward, as do others, to being in Portsmouth to commemorate this very important anniversary. Mr. Ian Duncan Smith. Mr. Speaker, um, 43 years ago, I, like uh, many others, was ordered to serve in Northern Ireland uh, to keep the peace uh, by terrorists attacking and killing uh, civilians in Northern Ireland. Uh, many of my colleagues and others did not come back, including one Robert Nyrak, a friend, who was tortured, murdered, and his body has never been found, nor his murderers ever been brought to justice. I simply say to my right honourable friend that in answer to uh, our, right, our honourable friend uh, earlier question, she talked about an amnesty. I must tell her that none of those who served have called for an amnesty. What they have called for is fairness and justice. Many, many old veterans now are finding, having been cleared decades ago, that the PSNI is now proceeding against them with no new evidence. Can I please ask her, will she answer me, how is it that I can say to my old colleagues that this government has not abandoned them? Prime Minister. My right honourable friend. We absolutely value the service that he and others uh, did in Northern Ireland. This was a very difficult time for a part of the United Kingdom, and uh, the work that the police uh, did and that the uh, armed forces did in Northern Ireland during that time was absolutely crucial. We are pleased that we have seen the peace that has come since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but there, were, there was obviously much injury and loss of life during the Troubles. As I indicated earlier, around 3,500 people were killed during the Troubles. The vast majority of those were murdered by terrorists. My right honourable friend talks about a fair and just system. We want to ensure that there is a fair and just system that is working uh, across the board to deal with these <coughs> legacy issues. But what is happening at the moment is that there is a disproportionate emphasis in terms of cases that uh, involve the police and the armed forces. There are cases involving terrorists that are being looked into, but I think uh, people would recognise that there is a disproportionate uh, emphasis on the uh, police and armed forces. What is important is that we therefore bring in a system which has full support and which will enable people to see that fairness and justice being applied. That is what the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland is working on. She has been working on that with the various political parties in Northern Ireland, and it is what we will, in due course, put forward. We recognise the sacrifice 
and the bravery and determination of our armed forces and the work they did in Northern Ireland. And we too want to see fairness and justice. Karen Bach. Speaker, it took time to get there, but the Prime Minister has now recognised that a no deal Brexit is not a viable option. But she knows, as well as the rest of us, that many of her potential successors do not feel the same way. So can she tell us whether she agrees with her Brexit secretary, amongst others, who thinks that we should be spending the coming months stepping up preparations for a no-deal Brexit, or with her Chancellor, who has issued an edict that no more Treasury money should be spent on preparing for a no-deal Brexit? Yeah. Prime Minister. As the lady knows, there is only one way of this House ensuring that it leaves the, we leave the European Union uh, without no deal, and that is to leave with a deal, and that is to support the uh, second reading of the withdrawal agreement bill and take that process through this, uh, through this House. Uh, uh, but the Honourable Lady, I'm sure, also knows that the legal default position continues to be uh, no deal. Were, it, were we to get to the 31st of October situation, I want us to leave the EU before then, but were we to get to the 31st of October uh, position, it will be a matter for the 27, not just for this country, to determine whether there was no deal or not. And that is why it is absolutely right that the Government is continuing to make preparations for no deal. Charles Walker. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker like so many people in this chamber, I want to see more monies for schools, hospitals, the police and transport. Is not, is not the best way of doing this to agree a deal that allows us to legally exit the EU, thereby unlocking three years of pent-up investment sitting on the sidelines, seeking certainty that the Prime Minister is trying to deliver and this party should be trying to deliver. Well, my honourable, my honourable friend is absolutely right. There is pent-up investment there. There are companies who have been holding investment back until they see the Brexit uh, deal being resolved. And it is important that we do see that deal going through this House. Supporting the Withdrawal Agreement Bill is the way to ensure that we deliver the Brexit that the people voted for, and we do it in a way that Conservatives stood on in their manifesto at the last election, and actually that the Labour Party members stood on in their manifesto at the last election. Once we are over this, once we have left the European Union, then we will be able to take advantage not only of the deal dividend, uh, but of that increased investment and see that bright future for our country. Jeff Smith. Uh, Mr Speaker, as, as a Manchester MP, can I thank the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for their words of remembrance for the victims of the terrorist attack in our city two years ago? In the light of concerns expressed about delays in accessing compensation, and the amounts offered to victims following the attack. Will the Government give consideration, when the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme is reviewed this year, to establishing a separate Government funding pot for victims of terrorist attacks, so it doesn't have to be taken from the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority funding, and so we can give more flexible and immediate support to victims of terror attacks? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Yes. Well, the, the Honourable Gentleman has, has uh, raised a very important point, and I recognise the force with which he's raised that and concern he has for those who were the victims of, the, uh, of that terrible attack. And of course, sadly, in this country, we have seen too many people being victims of terrorist attacks. Um, the Lord Chancellor has indicated that they, the Ministry of Justice is reviewing this situation. He has heard the specific proposal that the Honourable Gentleman has put forward, and I'm sure we'll take that into account in that review. Maria Caulfield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Returning to Northern Ireland, it's now two and a half years that there's been no devolved government in Northern Ireland, and every week on the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, we hear about the impact of this on ordinary people, whether it's on uh, quality issues, whether it's funding for the PSNI, whether it's uh, a pay rise for teachers who are paid 6% less than there are teachers in the rest of the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland is being left behind. Will the Prime Minister do all she can to restore devolution before the end of the year? Prime Minister. I give my my honourable friend, that reassurance. Um, I am as keen as she is to ensure that we see the restoration of devolution in Northern Ireland. I believe that, that uh, recently all the parties have come together with talks with the Secretary of State uh, and, uh, and uh, as appropriate, the Irish Government and are ensuring that uh, those, we are ensuring those talks are continuing. Obviously, there are issues that need to be addressed, concerns from the political parties on different issues. Those need to be overcome such that we can see devolution restored, because as my honourable friend uh, says, this is a matter for the people of Northern Ireland and to ensure they have a devolved government that can ensure that good governance in Northern, Northern Ireland. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On two previous occasions, I've asked the Prime Minister to do more to support the victims of the leasehold scandal. Now that she's about to move house any time soon, <laughs> will the PM give that a little more focus and urgently address this issue and give leaseholders justice? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, Honourable gentlemen, we have uh, uh, been listening to those who have raised concerns about this particular issue. Uh, last year, of course, my right honourable friend, the Housing Secretary, announced no uh, new government funding scheme will be used to support the unjustified use of leasehold for new houses. We have had a technical uh, consultation on how to improve the market for consumers. We are analysing the responses to that. We will respond to that and the recent Select Committee report on leasehold reform shortly, and we will introduce legislation in due course. Ian Patterson. Mr. Speaker. In reply to my right honourable friend for Chingford and Woodford Green, the Prime Minister quite rightly paid tribute to the 300,000 security personnel who, through their courage, professionalism and skill, maintained the rule of law, without which the Belfast Agreement would never have been signed. Correct. But she did not quite answer his question. None of those people who served defending the rule of law want a blanket amnesty. Correct. What they want is a categorical assurance that the prosecut prosecuting authorities within the existing framework of law will not bring forward a fresh process and that there is categorical clear new evidence and there is an assurance and no doubt whatever that a fair trial will proceed. Well, can I say Prime to Minister. you, right, friend, I absolutely appreciate the point that he and our right honourable friend, the member for Chingford and Wood Green, has made in relation to this issue. The problem we face in Northern Ireland is that there have been a number of processes uh, which have been aiming to deal with these, uh, these issues and justice in relation to uh, these uh, deaths during the, uh, during the Troubles, but all of the processes that have been followed so far have been found to be flawed in some way. That is why it is necessary uh, to go through this, uh, the, the work that we have been doing to find a process that will not be flawed, that will be legally uh, supportable and that will enable uh, the uh, fairness and justice that we all want to see to be brought to the fore. Laura Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the 2017 election campaign, the Prime Minister acknowledged that our social care system is broken and promised to fix it. Yet, the CEO of a care provider in Crewe and Nantwich recently told me that the decision to cut sleep in pay for care workers by up to £400 a month is a direct result of underfunding in the care sector. Will the Prime Minister consider bringing legislation to ensure sleep in shifts attract at least the national living wage and provide the necessary funding to local authorities so that it is possible to give care workers the pay that they deserve? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister! This issue of sleeping cover has, and pay for sleeping cover, has been one that the government has been dealing with. Um, we have had to address this as a direct result of a court case that was, uh, that was taken. We have been responding to that court case. I recognise the issue about the uh, question of pay for sleep in, uh, sleeping cover, and it's one, and, and in relation to the wider issue of social care, yes, we are going to bring forward proposals in relation to social care. We want to ensure that we have a sustainable social care system for the future. Pauline Latham. Would the Prime Minister welcome with me the, uh, the launch of Radio Reminisce, a fantastic new dementia-friendly radio to subscribe Subscription-based radio service designed to help and comfort people over 70 with early onset dementia, produced and developed in Belper in my constituency. Prime Minister. Right, can I say to my honourable friend, um, I, first of all, I, I thank her for raising this issue and for raising the issue of support, particularly with people with early onset dementia, and uh, for highlighting this new radio service. As she will know, the government is committed to double spending on research and dementia by 2020. Um, but in relation to the radio service, this is obviously a very practical way of providing support for people with early onset dementia, and I'm happy to join my honourable friend in welcoming this excellent radio service. I'm sure it's going to provide very important help to those who are suffering with dementia. Sangam Debonair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister must be considering her legacy, and she said she wanted to correct burning injustice. So will she commit to supporting legislation such as that proposed by my honourable friend, the member for Kingston upon Hull North, so that abortion in Northern Ireland becomes a health, not a criminal matter, and that as soon as possible, women have equal rights across 
across the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Prime Minister! The, the, you know, my view on the, uh, uh, what should happen in relation to abortion has been clear. I've made that clear in the past. But this is a devolved issue, and we believe this is something that should be addressed by uh, the devolved administration in Northern Ireland, where that's restored. E. Baker! Mr Speaker, as we look forward to the visit by the President of the United States, will the Prime Minister... friend agree with me that it is in the national interest that we support his visit, unite across the House and across the country to make a success of the visit so that our special relationship endures and, and grows and supports the success of this country as we exit the EU. Prime Minister. Can I, can I thank my honourable friend for raising this issue? And he is absolutely right. We are looking forward to the state visit of the President of the United States. We are also looking forward to the fact that President Trump will be joining myself and other leaders to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. This is an important commemoration when we will be recognising, as I said earlier in response to the honourable member from Portsmouth, the, uh, the, the sacrifice uh, that was made by British armed forces, by American armed forces and others from so many other countries to ensure the freedom of Europe. And uh, my honourable friend is also right. We have a deep and special relationship with the United States of America. It is important. That is our closest security and defence relationship, our deepest security and defence relationship. It is a relationship that has helped to keep uh, peace around the world. It is one we want to see continuing. And every member of this House should welcome the President of the United States of America here to the UK. Chris Law. We have repeatedly heard from the Prime Minister, and it would be, and I quote, an unforgivable breach of trust in our democracy if we fail to deliver Brexit. Yet, if the polls are correct, Scotland will be sending a clear message tomorrow that it wants to remain in Europe by increasing its number of SNP MEPs whilst wiping out the Tories. Should Scotland increase its number of pro EU MEPs tomorrow, Will the Prime Minister finally listen to the people of Scotland who want to determine their own future as an independent European nation, or will they breach their trust, leaving Scotland's people with Boris's Brexit Britain? Well, I suggest if the Honourable Gentleman wants to listen to the people of Scotland and their, uh, their view on their future, he actually starts listening to the decision they took in 2014 to remain part of the United Kingdom. Dr Philip Lee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. If polling is to, to be believed, uh, the winning party in tomorrow's Euro elections will be the Brexit Party. This party, in contrast to the Vote Leave campaign in 2016, has clearly stated that no deal Brexit is its policy. On the basis of normal uh, turnout, that means that between six and seven million people will have voted for no deal, which begs the question, what of the other 10 million Brexit voters in 2016? It concerns me and has long concerned me that we don't have the consent here in this House to deliver the Brexit that is likely to emanate from this House. With that in mind, and I congratulate the Prime Minister on the first steps yesterday towards acknowledging this, can she commit towards working, reaching out across this House in order to bring about the vote which remains to take Never. place, Never. which is the choice between having a final say of the British public or a no-deal Brexit? Prime Minister. I say to uh, my honourable friend that I, I do not recognise uh, actually the choice that he has set out and for this reason. First of all, as I said earlier, I have not changed my view on a second referendum. I have been clear that I believe this House should be delivering on the result of the first referendum. And the choice that is before this House, I believe, is that uh, whether or not it wants to deliver on the result of the first referendum and deliver on the manifestos on which the majority of members of this House stood, which were clear that we wanted to do that with a deal. We can do that. We can do that by uh, uh, giving second reading to the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, and seeing that bill through this House, seeing that bill get royal assent, ratify the treaty and leave the European Union. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Universal credit was today condemned again by the UN Special Repertoire who likened DWP policy to creating modern versions of 19th century workhouses. A leaked memo has revealed that the DWP is doubling down, promoting universal credit with an aggressive PR campaign, including a BBC documentary and adverts seen in today's Metro, 
which DWP officials state, and I quote, won't look like DWP or Universal Credit. You won't see our branding, and this is deliberate. Prime Minister, how is it right that the DWP is spending hundreds and thousands of pounds on misleading adverts that promote a cruel policy which is driving my constituents into debt, despair and destitution? Prime Minister! What the Department for Work and Pensions is doing is spending not just its resources but its effort, and I thank all the staff in DWP for this, in out there helping people into the workplace and ensuring that when they're in the workplace they are able to keep more of the money that they earn. Steve Double! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, two years ago, the Prime Minister visited the fishing village, uh, village of Mevigizzi. I'm sure she remembers it because she bought me some chips for lunch. Uh, the, the, people of, the people of Mevigizzi now face losing their only GP surgery because the remaining doctor there has given notice to hand back the contract to the NHS. I'm sure the Prime Minister will agree with me that it is vital that these rural coastal communities retain their primary care services. So what more can the government do to attract GPs to rural and coastal communities and will she use her offices to ensure everything possible is done to make sure Mevagizzi keeps its GP service? Well, can I, can I thank for my honourable friend for reminding me of the visit to the beautiful Mevagizzi and also uh, reminding him about the very good chips that I think he and I both shared on that, uh, on that occasion. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right about the importance of GPs to local communities, and I recognise the concerns that there are in Mevagizzi on this issue. Um, what we are doing is giving additional incentives to attract GP trainees into areas that are previously hard to recruit areas, such as rural and coastal communities. But I'm sure that uh, the minister, a minister from the Department of Health and Social, Service, Social Care will be happy to meet my honourable friend to discuss this particular issue. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For, for over two years now, the victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse in Northern Ireland have been waiting for justice and compensation following the independent report of Mr Justice Hart or ex-Justice Hart. The fact of the matter is many of them are dying without seeing the compensation come through. The NIO's policy of refusing to do anything in Northern Ireland, even when it has cross-community and cross-party support, has now come to the culmination of victims of abuse dying without seeing justice. This has got to stop. Will the Prime Minister intervene and make sure that action is taken to get immediate action for these victims? Well, can I say to the Prime Minister, I fully appreciate the extent of concern that there is about this issue. Of course, we have the wider. We also have our independent inquiry into child sexual abuse here in, in uh, England and Wales, and I recognise that the impact on all those who have been victims of this sort of abuse. Uh, we call it historical. He refers the, the, the investigation is referred to as historical investigation. For those who have been victims, it is not historical. It rests with them for the rest of their life. I recognise the concern about the issue that he has raised. Obviously, if the Northern Ireland Executive were in place, this would be a matter that the Northern Ireland Executive would be no, it would be a matter the Northern Ireland Executive would be addressing. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, has been looking at this issue, and I will uh, help discuss with her uh, what response can be given on what I recognise is a matter of deep concern to many people in Northern Ireland. Mark Francois. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question to the Prime Minister from a Northern Ireland veteran. His Royal Marine David Griffin, a Dublin-born Irish Catholic who joined the British Army, transferred to the Royal Marines. In 1972 in Belfast, he killed an IRA gunman who was about to assassinate one of his comrades at a guard post. Forty-seven years later, he is now being investigated by the PSNI. He is watching these proceedings now, Prime Minister, from his home at the Royal Hospital in Chelsea. He asked me to ask you this. I served my Queen and country in uniform for over 20 years and I was commended for my service in Northern Ireland. Acting under the lawful orders of my officer commanding, I killed a terrorist who was about to murder one of my comrades, and yet I am being investigated as if I were a criminal. The IRA have letters of comfort 
We don't. Why, Prime Minister, are you pandering to Sinn Féin IRA while throwing veterans like me to the wolves? What is your answer, Prime Minister, to this Chelsea pensioner and all the veterans he represents? Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend, he has put his case and that of the veteran he's represented, a Chelsea pensioner, and we thank that individual, as we do all those who served in Northern Ireland, for their bravery uh, and the determination with which they acted in Northern Ireland, which, as my uh, right honourable friend earlier said, former Northern Ireland Secretary said, enabled the peace that we see today in Northern Ireland to take place. It is not the case that the terrorists have an amnesty currently. Uh, if there is evidence of no, if there is, it has been made very clear that evidence of criminal activity uh, will be investigated, and people should be brought to justice. What I want to ensure, what, what I want to ensure, is that we do have a fair and just system. At the moment, I do not believe the, the system is operating fairly. I don't want to see a system where there is an amnesty for terrorists. I want to see a system where prop investigations can take place in a lawful manner, where the results of those investigations can be upheld and will not be reopened in the future. And in order to do that, we need to change the current system, and that is what we will do. Mr Speaker, over the last few days I have received distressed emails from a number of constituents who are EU citizens living in the UK but who won't be able to vote tomorrow. Their predicament arises because of the Prime Minister's Government's late decision to participate in the elections, which did not give many EU citizens enough time to fill out the necessary form declaring that they won't be voting elsewhere. Will the Prime Minister use all the power of her office to take immediate steps this afternoon to make sure that the necessary form is made available at polling stations tomorrow so that EU citizens living in the United Kingdom won't be disenfranchised. Well, can I say to the Honourable Lady that we take every step to make sure that those who are entitled to vote in elections are indeed able to, uh, to do so. But can I just say, she says it was a late decision by the Government to enter into the European uh, elections. Of course, that decision was taken because of a decision by this House not to agree on the 29th of March that we would agree the deal such that it would not have been necessary to hold European elections. Johnny Mercer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I think the Prime Minister in this House is beginning to understand the level of fury of veterans in this yeah, country yeah, when it comes yeah. to their treatment by this place over the years. But the most disturbing part of last weekend is this insinuation of equivocation between those who got up in the morning to go and murder women and children and civilians yes. and those who donned a uniform to go and protect the Crown. Here. Can the Prime Minister take this opportunity now? to tell the nation she sees no equivocation whatsoever between those two groups and that uh, the line that preferential treatment should not be given to veterans is not right. Uh, can, I, can I say to my honourable friend, uh, it is absolutely clear, I would have hoped from everything that I have said at this dispatch box, that I value the sacrifice, the bravery, the commitment of our armed forces, whose work in Northern Ireland, alongside the police in Northern Ireland and others, enabled us to get to the stage today that we have the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the peace that we have had in Northern Ireland for many years now, and long may that continue. There is no question of equating that bravery and that sacrifice with the acts of terrorists. But what I would also say to my honourable friend is that what he is, I think, from implication of his question, urging me to do is to put into place a system which would equate terrorists with members of the armed forces. Yes. Any, any statute of limitations, any amnesty that is uh, put into place would, as a matter of law, have to apply across the board. I do not want to see, and I will not see, an amnesty for the terrorists. Nick Dakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for recognising 
uh, the impact on steel workers and their families of the devastating news that British Steel has gone into liquidation and also thank her for recognising the high quality of work that they do on Teesside, Skinning Grove and indeed in Scunthorpe in my constituency. Will she meet with MPs cross party affected by this and uh, so that we can look together about how best to make sure this great industry moves forward in the future serving this country? Yes. Well, can I say to uh, the honourable gentleman, as I said earlier, I recognise this is a worrying time for his constituents and others. And uh, the government has been looking actively at what we can do. As I say, we've given the support we did through the uh, uh, ETS agreement, um, but haven't been able lawfully to, to give the further support that was requested. But I'll certainly meet with him and uh, a group of MPs to consider this issue. Um, this is about one company owned by Graybull Capital. But obviously, uh, we have taken steps in the past to ensure that we continue to have a steel industry in the United Kingdom, and we will want to look at that wider issue. Order.